Gunnar de Bois, Professor Emeritus of Human Development, the Florence Heller Graduate School for Advanced Studies in Social Welfare, Brandeis University, holds degrees in law and social work, which have enabled him to advocate nationally and internationally on behalf of persons with mental retardation. He has served as consultant throughout Europe, Central, and South America. He has provided expert testimony in significant class action litigation involving persons with mental retardation. Dr. Dubois served as director of the National Association for Retarded Citizens from 1957 to 1964. He and his wife, Dr. Rosemary Dubois, have received awards for outstanding service from the American Association on Mental Deficiency, the International League of Societies for the Mentally Handicapped, and most recently, the Kennedy International Award for Leadership in Mental Retardation. It may sound strange, but it is quite correct to say that individuals designated as mentally retarded led a lawless existence in the first half of this century in our country. That does not mean that they were criminals. Rather than sinning, they were sinned against by society, by being deprived of any benefits of law. They indeed were lawless without the protection of the law. And the only parallel to this we could find would be in uh, the uh, existence in our country of black people as slaves. They too were not persons, but their chattel were things. We now have so firmly established tremendous progress in the field of mental retardation, whether you think of education, whether you think of social adjustment, whether you think of vocational pursuits, whether you think of lessened dependence on the help of others, in what all areas of human life these uh, individuals termed mentally retarded indeed have now shown to us uh, most definitely that they are persons, that they have a humanhood uh, just uh, as all others of us have. Much uh, of the progress I have just referred to, of course, has been of uh, particular benefit to the thousands of uh, people in our state institutions, those large state institutions which have been characteristic of our country, of England and uh, of Canada. And uh, in uh, these uh, institutions, we have had in the past conditions which really were worse than uh, what went on in our prisons. And I can say this with certainty because both my wife and I started out in the prison field. In 1966, a Burton Blatt published Christmas in Purgatory, which uh, documented these very same conditions in uh, Massachusetts. And still, when the state of Massachusetts issued in uh, uh, later that year a uh, report uh, is, uh, signed by both the Commission of Mental Health and the Commission of Public Health and promulgated by the governor, uh, the condition in our institutions were not discussed, were glossed over. So uh, uh, this uh, indeed uh, indicates that uh, renewal in the field of uh, mental retardation was a very slow process uh, because uh, um, so many of our administrators, public officials, legislators, still had this old view of uh, the individual with mental retardation uh, really not having any rights. Whereas in our prisons, uh, the rights of prisoners were very well considered 
and uh, people actually maintain conditions there so as not to conflict with these rights. Change, of course, uh, uh, did occur, and uh, significantly, the change in uh, the viewpoint towards the rights of persons with mental retardation started at the very moment the National Association for Retarded Children uh, was uh, created in Minneapolis in 1950. The governor of uh, Minnesota, Luther Youngdor, was a distinguished jurist who later served on the Federal Circuit bench in uh, Washington. And this is what he had to say as he opened uh, this uh, first Congress, this founding convention of the National Association for Retarded Citizens. It is a rather stirring uh, oratory, uh, which, as you will see, was far ahead of the time. He said, this point is, ladies and gentlemen, the retarded child is a human being. Above and beyond being a human being, he is a child. And for reasons for which neither he nor his family are responsible, he is retarded. He has the same rights that children everywhere have. He has the same rights to happiness, the same rights to play, the same rights to companionship, the right to be respected, the right to develop to the fullest extent within his capacities, and the right to love and affection. He has these rights for one simple reason. He is a child, and we cannot discriminate against this child, deny to this child the rights other children have, because of the one thing that neither he nor his family can help, because he's retarded. Whether he's in Minnesota or any other state in the country, or in any other country in the world, he is still a child. But we have forgotten this, and with rare exceptions throughout the country, the provisions we have made for him are barbaric. The retarded child has a right to social assistance in the world in which he cannot possibly compete on equal footing. He has a right to special education. He said this in 1950. And to special institutions for the retarded child who cannot be taken care of at home. He has a right to be provided with the most modern training in an institution that is possible. In an institution marked not only by the pleasantness of its brick and mortar and lawns and play areas and education services, and child specialty medical services, but by an atmosphere and by a group of people in attendance who will not only give their child patient understanding, but to love and be affectionate to their child as other children get at home. He has a right to these things, and his parents have the right to know that he has these rights, for they too are entitled to peace of mind about what is happening to a retarded child separated from home. That is what Luther Youngdahl, the jurist and politician, said in 1950, and nobody understood it. Not even the people in, in, attendings, uh, in attendance at this uh, conference understood the meaning of what he had to say. They were just nice words, like a uh, 4th of July address. And uh, uh, it took uh, a long time for this to take effect. By the way, uh, Luther Youngdahl talked about the child because in this, uh, those days uh, we really still felt that uh, mental retardation was a child problem out of which you would not grow. And uh, it was only a little later, in 1960, when uh, I uh, submitted a report to the 1960 White House Conference on Children and Youth that I pointed out that insufficient attention uh, had been given uh, to, in the past to the legal status of uh, the mentally retarded child and adult, uh, particularly with reference to the degree um, of legal protection required as related 
to the degree of mental handicap. That was 1960. And in that same year, Senator Irwin of Watergate faith, fame uh, convened uh, a session of the Senate Judiciary Committee, of which he was chairman, in which he discussed uh, in detail the rights of mentally ill and mentally retarded persons. And the next year, the President's panel mental retardation, Kennedy's uh, contribution to our field, established a special task force on law of which Judge Bazelon and Dr. Elizabeth Boggs were the co-chairman. I had resigned from the National Association for Retarded Children. I served as executive director in 1963. And for three years, my wife and I were in Geneva, Switzerland, with the International Union on Child Welfare on a special mental retardation project. In 1967, I was called back to Brandeis University to assume direction of a a special doctoral program in mental retardation. And it was uh, during that period uh, that uh, uh, some uh, people came to visit me uh, from the Pennsylvania Association for Retarded Citizens. I'd worked with them for many, many years, uh, coming there frequently as a consultant, and I had helped them with the incredible problems which then existed uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, where thousands of children were excluded from any school attendance because of retardation, and where conditions existed in the mental retardation state institutions, which one really cannot discuss in polite society. They were so bad. Well, they came to ask for help. And I knew what the situation was. They had had made every effort up to several conferences with the governor himself, and some of them I attended, and with the Secretary of Welfare and with other high state officials uh, to beg for changes to be made. They had uh, been very active in the legislative field testified and indeed I arranged for some of my Scandinavian colleagues to actually come to Pennsylvania and testify before a legislative committee as to what could be done. And in addition, we had uh, some very uh, excellent publicity, uh, exposés of condition, but nothing, nothing was helping. And it was at that day that I said to my colleagues, uh, we've exhausted all these means, but there's one channel that remains open to us. We have a government that is divided into the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branch. We have never used the judicial branch. It is time to go to court. Well, we at Brandeis uh, that afternoon uh, quickly found agreement with my proposal. But when the proposal was brought back to the board of the Pennsylvania Association, they said, well, we can't do this. We could not possibly go to court and sue the governor, sue the secretary of welfare. It has taken us years to be on first name basis there's just no way to do it. And for six months we were stalemated until a very significant thing happened. It is an anecdote, but it is true, I was present. The Institutional Committee of the Pennsylvania Association made a report at the annual uh, convention to the Board of Directors, only to the Board of Directors. And the chairman of the institution committee, who happened to be a lawyer at that time, a Philadelphia lawyer, uh, made a report on some recent incident that had led in one of the institutions 
to the death of a child. And by the way, a death that was not even reported to the mother when a telegram addressed to her old address came back, nobody cared, and the mother came to visit and suddenly heard that her son had been dead for several weeks. The lawyer, in his best courtroom manner, uh, proceeded to talk about the case. We had been able to uh, find the body of the dead boy. It was already in a medical establishment, but still kept on ice. So we were able to go to court, insist on an autopsy. The attorney, very quietly, very calmly, in a soft voice, explained the damage to this boy. He had been burned, apparently, and so on. And what happened was that this board of directors, all of whom previously had been thinking of the secretary, of the governor, of their relationships, suddenly saw that what it was all about was a little boy who had been alive and now was dead. Why was he dead? And after that meeting, the board authorized the employment of an attorney to study the possibility of a lawsuit. That was the great change. And this, you see, one has to consider when one thinks about judicial action. Burton Blatt's exciting book, Christmas in Purgatory, dealt with societal issues. But when we go to court, when we ask a federal judge for help, we go to court on behalf of individual plaintiffs, and we ask the court to remedy injustice that happened to these individuals. And this is uh, what led to the employment, in this case, of an attorney. It was uh, Thomas Gilhul, who indeed uh, investigated and subsequently came forth with some very good suggestions as to what the State Association for Retarded Children should do. And very wisely, he decided that we should not worry about the institution as our first step. It was too difficult for judges, for the public, for others to understand the running of the institution. He said what everybody knows is that children ought to go to school. Let's start with uh, the denial of education for uh, children with mental retardation. And so the famous Park case, the first uh, case in this judicial revolution we've had in our country, uh, it got started in uh, Philadelphia in the federal courthouse. And of course it uh, resulted significantly in uh, a uh, consent agreement. Very quickly thereafter, in Washington, D.C., the Mills case uh, uh, came to the fore. And just to give you a flavor of what happens in these cases, I was asked to make a deposition and a question uh, which uh, the attorney for the uh, retarded children put to me was, can you state an opinion as to educational sufficiency of providing only two hours of instruction per week to institutionalized adolescents labeled as dull, normal, and mental, uh, emotionally disturbed. And I said an answer in my deposition, the fact that a child may have to reside in an institution does not diminish his need for schooling. To the contrary, anyone acquainted with the limitations and deprivations imposed by institutional living realizes that children in institutions need the guidance and stimulation of a full-scale education program. To provide for such children or young people two hours of instruction per week can only be compared to giving a starving child two meals a week. Two meals a week do not make a diet, and two hours of instruction per week do not make an educational program. The Mills case uh, was the first case uh, which was 
solved with a judicial decision, not just a, a consent decree. And uh, as such, has gone down in history as a very significant federal case. My next involvement with the judiciary process on behalf of persons with mental retardation was the famous uh, Alabama case, Wyatt versus Dickney, which was a most memorable occasion because uh, I was privileged to get to know Judge Johnson, one of the most distinguished, most conservative uh, judges on the federal district bench. The point I want to make uh, is this, that at the first hearing in this case, Judge Johnson, eager to avoid a long, drawn-out court case, gave the Commissioner of Mental Health of Alabama six months to come forward with uh, a plan to remedy the conditions about which the complaint had been filed. Actually, it was seven months until the court reconvened. But the document which the executive branch had prepared through uh, the uh, uh, commissioner, Stonewall Stickney, and good southern tradition, that was his name, was so inadequate that the judge uh, refused to accept it, and we had to go to trial. I happened to be the lead of witness in this case. And uh, the attorney was asking me whether I thought that really what people were receiving in that institution was no more than custodial care. And I said, oh no, I could not say this. Because how could you speak of custodial care of custody in an institution where nobody was safe from injury, from attack, from just unspeakable conditions? So this hardly could ever be termed custodial care. This happened to impress the judge and also was uh, an important argument in the ensuing uh, review of the case by uh, the Circuit Court of Appeals. One other point I want to bring in because it is not as extraneous as it may appear. Judge Johnson, in his decision, referred to the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of mentally retarded persons. He did so uh, to indicate uh, that indeed we were dealing with a new era, an era where the recognition of the rights of mentally retarded had not received just national but international recognition. It's interesting to say in a few words how this declaration came about. The International League of Societies for Persons with Mental Handicap, the organization of which the National Association for Retarded Children, now citizens, uh, is a member, convened in 1967 in Stockholm a uh, symposium on legal and legislative problems. And uh, that group of international scholars and of course, once again, New Jersey was represented by Elizabeth Barks, came forth with a very significant section in their recommendations. And I would like to read just a f one paragraph from it. That section dealt with individual rights and said, the symposium considered that no examination of the legislative aspects of the problem of mental retardation would be complete without general consideration being given to the basic rights of the mentally retarded, not only from the standpoint of their collective rights and those of their families, but also from that of the individual rights of the retarded person as a human being. And then the ensuing recommendations uh, were reviewed the following year 
by the next World Congress of the International League held in Jerusalem under the very significant title From Charity to Rights. And uh, uh, the, the, the Congress uh, fashioned uh, by general agreement uh, a Declaration of Rights that was in 1968. And nobody could have convinced me an optimist that there ever was one in those days that within three years the United Nations would have adopted this declaration without a dissenting vote. But that is what happened. And just as a by the way, four years later, this declaration of the rights of the mentally retarded was extended by the United Nations as a general a declaration of the rights of disabled persons in general. A rare incident where retarded people were leading the way. The question can well be raised, um, was all the expense, and it was considerable expense, the disruption, the judicial encroachment on executive agencies really justified by the results obtained? Well, it would seem to me that the answer is best being given by the thousands, indeed by now the tenth of thousands of children who are now in school who previously were deprived of their education. Uh, by the thousands who faced abuse and neglect in institutions whose fate has been substantially alleviated even though much remains to be done. They and their families will readily acknowledge the debt they owe to the judiciary. But beyond uh, these personal uh, long overdue gains, uh, there are very many systemic improvements that have come to us in the wake of these court decisions to bring to this field at long last a renewal in uh, what we uh, call mental retardation.